to another panel and uh, please welcome Michelle Reznik. He's from uh, 4H Agency. He's Banking and Payments Head. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Eva. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for your patience. We greatly appreciate it. Um, I'd like to invite everybody to move a bit closer given that there aren't too many people so we can have like an intimate discussion on the topic of embracing new technology. One door closes, another one opens. Um, I'd like to thank SPC for kindly organizing this conference. It's been absolutely phenomenal. I hope you agree. Um, I'd like to thank all the sponsors, the state sponsors, the conference sponsors, the school sponsors. Without you, it wouldn't have been possible. And without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce my very esteemed panel and experts in their own rights, in their own fields, to talk about the topic of the day. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves very, very quickly before we jump on to the topic of the day. So, Victoria, starting with you, if you'd like to give a quick introduction to who you are and what you do and why you're here. <laughs> Thank you very much. So my name is Victoria Shortis. I'm a founder of PSP Angels. Um, we are a payment consultancy, uh, and we help uh, high-risk verticals finding their uh, bank accounts, payment service providers, and we try to um, show to our clients how banks think. So it's more than just a matchmaking. We really explain uh, what are the real risks in, uh, in the industry and, and what are the possibilities, uh, setting up the payment plan, and overall understanding the, the whole uh, payment procedure, obviously for cheaper and safer providers as well. So thank you very much for having me today, and I'm really looking forward to this panel. Brilliant. Thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure, Victoria. Michael. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, uh, hi, I'm Michael. I'm the CFO for uh, Quiff, which is a BC operator uh, based mainly within the UK. Um, we're a technology-first business. We are completely proprietary in our, with our technology. Um, we're a sports book led um, offering, but also casino platform as well. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Michael. What about Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Salvatore Cicero. I am Global Head of Development here at PXB Financial. PXB Financial is a, a long standing mature payments provider. Uh, we, uh, we, um, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we, um, we're, we're a global payment provider. We, yeah, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, I'm Vashku, um, I'm the head of marketing for our own solutions. We are a payments uh, reconciliation company. Uh, we help companies rec uh, automate their reconciliation from end to end uh, and remove all the frictions of that process. Michael, it's a pleasure. Um, welcome, everybody. I think we're going to divide the talk to see what's coming into three parts. I'm trying to closed doors and open doors, and I think in between we're going to talk about the heart of the matter, which is technology and how it is helping, improving, developing, and affecting our industry. We'll also be talking a little bit on regulation because it is inextricably linked with technology, as you can imagine. But I think starting with um, the closing doors, what are the doors that are presently closing? What is the feeling in the market? What is being shut in our faces right now? Um, for anybody to volunteer to kick this off. Um, looking at you, Victoria, but otherwise I'll pick on somebody sure. else. No, it's fine, obviously. That's why we are here today to discuss everything. Um, uh, I can see from my clients uh, the frustration, and if I can you know, kick start hard, this is exactly the problem where I can see and uh, meet uh, on a daily basis that um, all these um, compliance is, is, is getting harder and getting stricter in a way that it's, it's almost choking uh, the, the reasonable and the, and the good business as well. And obviously our uh, job as payment consultants to, uh, to show to the client that what are the real needs uh, for these kind of compliance um, uh, procedures and what is the reason for all of that. So why the banks are forcing certain uh, re restrictions and regulations uh, in our industry. And obviously it's needless to say that, that our industry is, is, is in a very, very um, good position because um, even though that we are not really innovating anything new, the money is there. So it's, it's very hard to make any kind of mistake 
in a way that it's, it's not going to result in any kind of further income. So when we are going to Latin America, when we are going to new emerging markets, or even just do what we do in the existing markets, Yes, it is getting harder, but it's still profitable compared to other fintech companies, uh, which are not in a very, uh, you know, beneficial position of, of uh, having this kind of benefit. Oh, that's interesting. And what is your opinion? Is it the door is shutting, or is it actually shut? There are some doors which are shutting down, which should be shut down. So what we can see that the, the black markets and, and, and all these kind of uh, cowboy attitudes, which should not really be followed, it is indeed being shut down by the banks and the financial institutions. Because if you think about it, the government's only tool to collect the relevant tax money, to fight uh, money laundering, to fight tax avoidance, is through the financial institutions. So whatever is happening, it's good. We just need to find that, that, that really fine balance of when it's not really choking the, the actual good business. No, absolutely. And it's possibly an opportunity because it could rehabilitate the industry in innovation. I don't know, gentlemen, Michael, Vasco, if, if you want to yeah. add something on the, on the point of the closing doors. Yeah, I think, I think within closing doors, we there's been a lot of talk, as there always is, about compliance and, and the regulatory frameworks that, that exist in the different countries we operate in. But also there's opportunity, you know, when, when I think about what we do, we're a technology first business, we have uh, access to such a tremendous amount of, of our own data, more so than probably many other operators. And actually that's, a, that's an advantage of closing doors when you talk about the, the tightening on compliance restrictions. So the ability to use data in a way which uh, our technology allows us to, to, to look at players in the right way. And so we can look at um, their profile in much more granular detail than than uh, you know, other operators are able to. And so that means we can, we know what the player likes more than other people. We can give them the right product offering. We can improve their customer journey better. So the tightening of, or the closing of a door with compliance actually does offer, for the right companies, it offers the opportunity as well. Yeah, I think, uh, like Max said, it's about the experience. We often paint the regulations and the compliance part as as bad for the business. I mean, it, it is a pain in the back. You have to learn a lot. You have to study a lot about how things are changing and you have to make a lot of changes in the business and how you do things. But ultimately, it's for, it's for the good of both ends. It's for the good of the companies that are still making profit. It's for the good of the players. It allows companies to know their players better. Uh, it allows them to provide better experiences, longer experiences. Um, so ultimately, the result will be good. Yes, it's annoying, but I think the end goal is good. Um, since we're touching on regulation and compliance, let's jump straight into that topic. Um, how do you feel that the topic of compliance, and I know um, Vasco mentioned um, the word annoying, but I'm sure there are kind of merits uh, to it in an extent, especially to touch upon our second topic of opening doors, because we're exploring the topic of a new technology here, which means that, you know, there's two ways you, you can have both technology and gaming operators. You can have them regulated and unregulated, regulation, whilst using your words, annoying, um, could bring a form of legitimacy and comfort to the people, to the users, to the operators. So perhaps there is an interrelation between regulation and new technology, which opens doors more than shuts. But I, I would love to hear your expert opinion on that. I think from the regulation point of view, I was, we're talking uh, outside, for example, all the time. Um, I remember a couple of years ago that we wanted to offer certain payment methods that it was completely impossible uh, because they were not regulated, clients got their accounts shut down, it was a mess, it was super complicated. And with regulations obviously come rules, but also opens door to new payment methods, opens door to new players to come in and enjoy the games and have fun uh, and bet in your casino and all of that. So yeah, of course, regulations, difficult, but uh, opens doors to um, a wider audience and opens up to new solutions, new technologies, uh, new payments companies. It's, yeah, it's a lot of doors uh, are open during the regulation process as well. What I hear, regulation is a good thing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, I, yeah, I guess uh, in terms of doors opening, as you mentioned, um, I don't think we can discount blockchain technology. Uh, looking at Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, PigsP have and continue to integrate into a bunch of crypto exchanges. Um, and whilst there isn't mass adoption, um, 
you know, there, there is a school of thought which says, well, look, if the regulators do tighten this up, you know, could actually that invoke mass adoption? Uh, and, and if that does happen, then P2P want to be at the forefront of that. I think another spin to this is, um, you know, gamers that want to stay in the digital currency space, may, you know, they don't necessarily want the volatility. So stablecoin could be an alternative to that. Uh, and that's another area that we're, we're looking to invest in and, and bring our solutions to market. No, absolutely. And you mentioned several new technologies. What kind of changes do you believe it's going to bring in practice? Because, you know, it's, it's, it's good to name tag different things, but sure. what will actually change in practice? And where will PXP Financial be coming into there? Yeah, so, so notoriously, PXP Financial um, have had its services, its platform run on uh, data centers, they're on-prem, um, but we're in our next technology evolution now, our next technology iteration, and, and we're looking to really go down the cloud first route, so it's part of our cloud transformation program. Um, and if I was to kind of ask the question, how does cloud first help us grow with our merchants? There's probably a few key points. One is automatic scaling. So, is that okay? Uh, yeah, so, so automatically scaling up or scaling out, um, this, this is a big one for us. So no matter what the load is, your transaction speed remain at a cons consistent space. Uh, and certainly something that I've been burnt with over the past is, you know, when you're designing highly scalable solution software, the app stack is uh, kind of probably the more simpler of areas to scale out. It's the data store that underpins it, which is where the issue lies. And, and with a cloud-first approach, you have more accessibility. There, there's more options actually to scale out that, that specific data layer to make sure transactions are going through in a consistent manner. Um, another area would certainly be um, redundancy and, and high availability. Um, so, you know, no different to an on-prem environment. You have to make sure that your, your routes, your avenues, when you're processing transactions or you're gathering data for reporting, or maybe just, you know, have an accessibility to a portal it has to be underpinned with a real good redundancy strategy. Uh, and once again, I think cloud offers that in an abundance. It, it allows us to um, uh, configure both at infrastructure and component level, um, you know, very, very granular. So it, it gives us, gives us that, that, that flexibility. And just two other key points, if you don't mind, Michelle, is, is the design principles. So um, we follow, as part of our cloud-first approach, uh, a microservice uh, our architecture. So we're making sure that our systems or our services are built and designed in such a way that they're very loosely coupled. They have a very defined interface. They have their own data store. What does this mean in practice? Well, it means that we can deploy our solutions into production without really affecting the rest of the platform. And really what it does do, it encourages regular uh, deployments, whether they're monthly, uh, weekly, or even daily, getting product to market. Uh, and just, just one last one I want to mention is event sourcing, which is a personal favorite of mine. So event sourcing by its very nature allows us to uh, trigger events and then farm off uh, a task within the system. Don't believe this type of design principle should be limited to the mechanics of our own internal system. It's something we can expose to our merchants. So, so if they wish to consume those data, those events, then this is where you, you generate that level of friction. So an example could be uh, low-level state changes uh, on authentication or authorization, where you directly feed the merchant with that, that BI, that, that uh, data insights immediately. We, we've had so many conversations with merchants more recently where they, as I said, they want that level of friction because it's quite key to their business. Um, so I think just, just to kind of summarize this, um, I don't think merchant demands have changed over time. You know, the system has to be accessible has to be scalable, uh, transactions have to continue performing at fast speeds, and ultimately needs to be stable. So I think, you know, when you look at some of these design principles, they're not new, they're not revolutionary, but going down a cloud-first approach does allow you to implement these design principles with a new technology, much faster, much simpler. And, and I think really what that allows us to do as an organization is focus more so on bringing product to market rather than the, the mundane infrastructure piece. Before I move on, and apologies, Salvatore, I, I, I don't mean to pick on you, but for people that don't 
necessarily, um, you know, would you be able to summarize in two, three words? When you mentioned the cloud first approach, it's a very interesting concept, but would you be able to summarize it in two, three words, like what is it that it means for those that hear, hear about it for the first time, like myself? Sure, I mean, it, it avoids having to, you know, purchase your own hardware. We're offsetting hardware into the cloud um, and allows us to deploy our solutions anywhere across the world. Um, and ultimately, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it allows us to focus more so on delivering product rather than the heavy lifting architecture piece that you normally have to consider when on-prem. Absolutely. So the cloud first approach should it itself be a new part of a new technology. Uh, I think to, to just pick on Salter there, you know, the cloud first approach is, well, has to be the way in which operators look at things as well. It's, it's fundamental to how we we build our technology, and again, microservice architecture is, is how we build things as well. Um, but an important point really is the, from, from say a PSP to an operator, the, the speed of data is the critical part for when I look at things. So having that real time information is critical to understanding the customer, it's critical to making sure that their journey is, is the, the right journey, and it's, whilst I understand the point of friction, for the customer you want it frictionless. Sure. For us, why that's so important. And it's interesting because um, someone told me once that money is like water. It's going to find a way. If there is no way, it's going to make its own way. And this is many times that we see in the, in, in the technology that it does actually follow this kind of uh, uh, mentality. Because uh, when you're shutting down one door, um, then we see the blockchain technology emerging, then we see the decentralization, then we see new ways of, okay, Visa, MasterCard, for example, is too expensive in certain cases or too restrictive in, in, uh, in, in others. Then we see the top-up cards, then we see the vouchers. So, so in a way that the restriction also creates um, a, a different mindset and a, and a creativity of how to actually uh, handle payments. And um, I was in a, a, in a world conference and uh, someone told me that uh, there are some countries, obviously, when the banking system collapsed. And people uh, have this uh, mobile, what you are topping up with minutes. So you're going to the village, and it's, it's actually in Africa, you go into the village, you pay $10 uh, to the kiosk, and you've got whatever 200 minutes out of it. And then you go back to your village, and you're asking that how much is that chicken, or how much is that bread? And they say it's like four minutes, it's two minutes. So what we see here is a new banking technology emerging out of a need, which is free, because I can transfer my minutes for you for free. It's free to, to own those, those kind of minutes, and it's a new way of of bartering within that small ecosystem. And if we are embracing all these technologies which are coming out of a need, that's when I believe that when we have a, a true success, because the needs is there first, and then if we embrace that further, that really uh, serves our, our way of handling payments as a provider, as a merchant, as a client, uh, on moving money around. I can give you an example because we use that exact technology in Kenya and Uganda where we, we also have licenses. And it is, I actually think it's an incredibly efficient way of dealing with the transactions for the customer and, and also for the operator. Providing you've built it correctly and it, it integrates with the, the telco uh, in the right way, then it's, it's instantaneous, it's almost instantaneous. And it is, um, yeah, we, we certainly had a challenge in terms of changing our mindset from how we, we operate with. Uh, whether it's you know an, an APM or uh, like a wallet or uh, what open bank money, whatever it may be, to then come into that that sort of uh, very new, well, very different type of technology, but it's a, an effective way of doing things. And what is the most traded cryptocurrency in the world? USDT. Why? Because I still need to transfer dollar in a quicker, cheaper, better, more efficient way, and this is the kind of technology which grows around that need. Accessible yet, which is new technology for them, but maybe not.
not new technology for us. And maybe there is still some mileage in that, because you obviously got your experience in, in, in the African countries. Um, me living in Mexico, we've got a very similar situation, what you say kind of resembles me very much, but there, there's another concept. There's many regions still that don't have internet. Yeah. And what the payment companies do, they team up with that internet provider and ensure that there's free Wi-Fi in the area. So, you know, for us, we live with internet for however many years, we're there, internet becomes the new technology and shows that maybe in many parts of the world, instead of trying to kind of reinvent ourselves and invent kind of secret technology, we might need to exploit what we have now, which to penetrate regions which, which don't have access to, which will, you know, create social benefits. And I'm not sure what, what you think about that. Yeah, those, are the, those are the doors which are opening in this, in this subject, in this case, that yes, there are some doors which are closing down, the traditional fiat way, the compliance, the regulation and whatnot. But on the other hand, we've got so many new brilliant technologies which are emerging out of this kind of human need of I still need to transact, I still need to move money and, and that's what we see in the blockchain. And in my opinion, because we are working a lot of uh, PSP partners, those PSPs uh, and, and, and banking facilities and payment providers are the most successful who really understand this kind of need and, and developing further on that existing need. Uh, I don't know how you guys are doing the Salvatore in, in, in your PSP of uh, in, in, terms of days. in terms of blockchain? Of like, you, you see how there is a need and obviously how... how yeah, I mean, uh, for, for us it's, it's about, you know, uh, integrating with the exchanges really. Uh, and just giving that variety to, to our merchants. I think, working. I, think, I think the other one we haven't mentioned actually is open banking. Um, you know, looking at it from a, a very, very top level, if you think about some of the beneficiaries you get for consumers, authentication is one. Uh, so, you know, it makes it safer and quicker, in fact, to, to make payments. Uh, transaction speed is another. So, you know, down, down the chain, you've got less friction. Um, and uh, another important one is familiarity, I think, from a consumer point of view. They, they almost a bit more trusting of it because it's their open banking app uh, and actually that could spark off more mass adoption and we're, we're seeing that in an incline, aren't we, with the trajectory at the moment, certainly in the gaming space. So that, I think that's another one. I'd agree on that. I mean, I think, God, sound keeps going on this one. Yeah, if you look at places like Finland, I mean, that is, or Sweden, for example, that's kind of the, the, the start, the kickstart for open banking, really. That, and it is transcending, if you look at the UK, the adoption there has, as you say, really increased. I, I do think that is an incredible opportunity. When I look at it as an operator, there's lots of opportunities that exist within that method, whether that's to do with compliance or indeed frictionless payment. Um, but it certainly is a growing area, and I think we'll, I actually just think, knowing some of the companies that exhibit here, their plans, and I think in you know, certainly three to five years, that there'll be a, a huge advance in, in that technology. Yeah, no, I agree. Yes, I agree, and um, I just had a chat with, uh, with someone uh, yesterday who is a head of payment of a very uh, famous um, uh, operator, and she told me that if she could design a cashier system, it would be much better than any other cashier system out there because she acts on a need, and then she can actually translate all these kind of frustration of a user experience, and I think we will see more and more um, of, of those kind of technologies are emerging from the user experience. Um, what we see that, that it, it really fits those kind of needs which are m maybe now not addressed. Of course, and could I just jump a step back on a topic which I feel which is very interesting for me, which is education. Because for new technology, the mass adoption to, uh, to succeed you need education. But it's not only education of the masses, is it? It's Emergence, it's the education of the regulators, it's the education of states as well, who's regulating, creating laws for this. So, um, just wanted to get a feel of your thoughts on, you know, how we're doing with the education now. What should we do with essential education, and kind of how to drive this education forward? Because surely, without education, you won't have closing or opening doors. Uh, I think education. Uh, from my side, as a marketing point of view, it's it's becoming more and more one of the ground bases of marketing in all the companies that are coming up with these open doors. You know, 
we come with new technologies, uh, we come with new ways of doing things. Uh, people are facing the challenges and they, they are having the problems, but it's part of our strategy uh, as new companies coming up, educate both ends on what it means to adopt these technologies, what are the benefits, uh, and how can you actually use it and how can it be beneficial to your business. Um, and I think as a strategy, it's, it's, it goes well, it, it benefits both ends uh, because it allows people to be educated in something that is new, uh, but it also uh, explains how you can help them. And um, the good thing about these doors that open and about the education is that um, these shows are growing and growing and growing, more companies, more uh, niche things that are appearing, more niche solutions, and um, there's opportunity for everybody to come in. There's, a, there's an opportunity to bring any solution that will help uh, the operators uh, and other players to run their businesses smoothly. Um, and most of the education should come from that, should come from the companies that they want to disrupt the market, they want to help people, um, and they need to explain how they can help um, and what is the issue. Well, of course, and I understand your company does their part of education. Would you mind explaining to us sort of how you go about it, sort of what do you in practice to educate people, just to get an understanding of what, what it means for your company to educate? I think starting point from our end is, um, as a unique entity is uh, we provide free content for people to actually read and educate themselves or uh, in a marketing point of view, webinars, or coming to these uh, discussions, doing the panels, coming to the events, talking to people, uh, explaining what is happening, uh, and actually educating ourselves, because we cannot innovate or we cannot offer any services if we're not up to date or if we don't understand what is uh, changing. And I think that's the beauty of this industry, right? It's like, nothing is ever the same. Everything is in constant evolution, everything is challenging, and maybe that's the, the thing that grabs us into this. It's like, it's never boring. Everything is changing constantly. Um, and on the other side, you have amazing uh, companies like uh, iGaming Academy that offers uh, solutions to educate any kind of players. And we partner with those companies also to um, offer those services to uh, make sure we have free resources so for people to understand how can they do it better, how can they improve their processes, and what is coming next on regulations that they should be aware of and they should be preventive and they should start thinking about it now before it's too late. And it's 90% of my work, for example, as a payment consultant, is really educating the client that you can do this, you cannot do that. Yes, we wish that we could have done that, but we don't do that. So, so everything is about to understand why the regulator is thinking in a certain way, why the bank is restricting certain payments, why is it, uh, uh, is it important. And based on that, they can actually create a payment plan and the payment flow uh, understanding, which is a longer lasting solution than just like bouncing between different payment providers and banks. So what I can say as a consultant, definitely, it's our responsibility as industry experts to pass on the knowledge and, and make people understand why things are happening other than just, yes, it's working, it's not working, but you really need to, to, to explain to them in this ever changing world, what is the reason behind those kind of thoughts? And I think, you know, as a community, as a uh, uh, gambling community, we, we help each other, right? Yeah. If we know something that is better, and if we yes. actually know a better way of doing things, we like to share. There's, I think that's the beauty of it is in this industry, is we yeah. share with what we know with the people that are here. We see each other so many times, yeah. and there's no point. We always want to evolve and grow, so we yeah. can help each other, and that's, that's really nice. No, clearly, and you know, what I hear is that education is the responsibility of everybody. Um, I don't know, I don't know, Mike, so I don't know, would love to hear a little bit kind of, of the educational part of, um, of your respective businesses, or maybe if you do anything outside, just you know, to get to some really picture of how we penetrate the message of the new technologies. I'd like to take a slight different tangent on it in terms of education, because I think, I think what, when we talk about closing doors, I think you can stop a door closing by collaboratively, um, to your point here, collaboratively educating regulators, um, financial institutions. It takes time and it takes momentum. But if we look at crypto, for example, both gaming regulators in the main and traditional banks, right? They, 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 they don't really um, trust it probably is the right phrase. Um, and that's, 
I don't think that's very well founded. I think there's there's such an education that's required there. And so the evolution of um, of crypto technology in particular will will eventually gain momentum and it will help with with any with regulators and with, with uh, financial institutions. You just gotta hope that they have the appetite to be educated. It's a two way thing. And that's that's where Consultants can, can play their part in, in, in educating and, and do that internally. Of course, from a if we, if we talk education generally, we, we have we operate a, a supercharge uh, it's a pricing mechanism within our it's one of our USPs. It's quite unique. You know, it's we say completely unique. And when we look at again uh, in Africa uh, as a new market for us, we have to do a lot of education with how that works. Um, equally, when you have new payment methods. Education is critical, not only educating your customer on how it's working. I think banking is a good example of that as well, where people didn't really quite get what was going on to begin with. Um, but then also internally, your customer support teams and, and so on need that education. And yeah, it's, it's a critical part, of course, of what any operator will do. No, clearly. And um, I think since we're talking about different regions and application in different parts, surely there's an element to be played in uh, localization that you need to adapt your product to every region in order for it to be successful, in order for the doors in each region to open. So um, if you have any experience you'd like to share on kind of localization, competitization, and anything to do market, especially we're talking about very, very interesting and exotic markets here, and I'd love to hear about them. I had a client, and uh, they came up to me that uh, I would like to have cards in Venezuela. Like, why? Because we are targeting Venezuela, we put a lot of money in marketing to target Venezuela, Latin America is the future, emerging market, give me cards. It's like, no. <laughs> it, it, so, so this goes back really about the education, about the market research, about, about um, um, balancing out your marketing strategy with the finances, with the PSPs that's available for you, and actually understanding your market. And I think, um, yes, of course, as a payment consultant, that's, that's, uh, that's a majority of our job as well, but also for payment providers, going back again with the, with the education, we should actually explain that, that what are the, uh, the markets that, uh, that works with, with what type of, uh, of, of payment methods and, and how it could be beneficial for the client and why those payment methods are the one that you're using, not just because of uh, choice, but maybe because of force that Venezuela, for example, is using crypto, uh, kind of thing. I mean, just to sort of follow on there, a quiff we've gone through um, the, the, the experience you, you, you asked about. Um, the, the big mistake operators can make, and we didn't make, that you can go in and say, hey, this is a UK product that works really well. We've got great customers in the UK. Let's just go and roll that out everywhere. Obviously, you see examples of where, where various, various operators go and do that in different territories, and of course, it doesn't work because, well, the first thing is to be in any other jurisdiction and make it work. You've got to allow payments. You've got to make sure it works. You quite like the localization of knowing whether a place accepts cards or mobile money or open banking is is critical. And so, the research, your research before doing something, you should spend so much more time really doing the research part before you go ahead and just launch. It's it's easy to turn a switch, but actually if it's not fit with the purpose, then you're going to waste marketing dollars and it, you might as well just, you know, it will just burn. So uh, the research is incredibly important. Um, yeah, and, uh, and don't, uh, don't believe your own hype in some respects. Don't believe because you're so good in the UK, you're going to work good in whatever other market you choose. And I think something to add to that is that after just I'm, they're really this I believe this comes from the, the finance side. There's so much data within your company. There's so much information. Just make sure that after you do it and after the research and you implement it, pay attention to the data, organize the data, uh, find the information because you will find a lot of answers within and you don't need to go outside. You will have a lot of information there. You just need to organize and have access to it. Um, and I think one of the probably the departments that have more information is the finance one because everything comes to finance and the money. Uh, so there's a lot of answers that we can have inside as well uh, when you have access to the right data. No, no, that, that's phenomenal. It's, it's interesting to bring up that. I don't know if you agree with me, just from one perspective, that new technology, like in a good, it's not putting on a switch. It's not just creating something. There's so many elements to it. And when you speak about new technology, you have to consider all the elements. Maybe, and I don't know if you'll agree, or maybe I'm exaggerating, like the, the 
functionality itself becomes a minority part in terms of the full equation of what you need to do and consider for, for it to be successful. Um, I was shown some minutes ago that, you know, we're not on time yet, there's still some time for us to talk, but before hogging the stage too much, I want to see if anybody in the audience had any questions for our um, excellent panel. If I did forget to ask something, or if you have a burning question that, that you wish to ask. So I guess full marks for us, we've covered everything. But um, <laughs> moving on then, we touched upon different new challenges with Canada kind of pursuing this aspect of things. Um, do you want to share with us your vision of what, what we'd like to see in the future, next kind of five, ten years? And in looking into the future, kind of also tag off different technologies we covered, maybe some we haven't done, just to get a vision, like what is your vision of this new technology some of it which might survive and adopt, some of it which might die, but kind of what is an, on our roadmap, or maybe what's on your personal roadmap for, for the foreseeable future? Right, in my personal opinion, I think uh, we will see a lot of, uh, uh, of the web stream and the, and the meta, uh, yep. which brings uh, the built-in uh, currencies and, and payment methods uh, in terms of uh, cryptocurrencies with it. So I believe that there's going to be more and more regulation around it. The digital money becomes the traditional fiat money replacement, hopefully in a, in a, in a better structured way. But the decentralization will be uh, regulating itself. And it's to read just my personal opinion that there's not going to be one uh, appointed regulator over everything, but the system will regulate itself through smart contracts, uh, through different uh, ways and methods, because that's the only way I cannot really see any more compliance force being put on, on, on the financial institutions without cracking under the cost. That's, that's just my personal opinion. So blockchain is the future, we've got it. Definitely. Yeah. And I think one thing to add to that is automation. Uh, it's a process yeah. of if, if, when decentralization comes and takes over and uh, regulations, and you can build um, the platforms and the technology that will automate those processes because like you said technology is a part but it's a tiny part the majority of it is processes and people and how you structure um, so yeah automation how you structure the data uh, that's that's a big that's a big step I think. Oh, I think again from, from an operator's point of view um, not quite on the payment side but the automation thing is important we love automation we, we that's kind of one of the main components of our business model is to automate and make intelligent the tools we have. Um, you know, we, we, we have automated trading in our sports book, which is a feature which actually should really be in every operator's um, uh, business, but it isn't because it's still very manual. And I think that will be one of the changes we'll see um, from, a, from, an op from a sports book operation point of view. But also, to go back to the point on crypto, absolutely, I think crypto is the way forward. Um, how it evolves through regulation will be interesting to see. I hope that it, uh, I hope it does have elements of, of um, regulation involved, but but not so stringent that they that they close the door. Um, but hopefully that will be more of the future, giving that, that seamless ability for customers and operators, and, and whichever con consumer you are, you know, having that seamlessness. I think that's the the, the, the vision for the future of IT. Brilliant. Um, I think we're coming close to time. If anybody got any last words, please take them now or forever hold your peace. Um, but in any event, I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude to Victoria, to Michael, to Lagore, to Vasco for your time, for your expertise, for your generosity. It's been phenomenal. I've learned plenty. I hope you share my sentiment. And I can't wait to see you again same time next year. Thank you all. Thank you Thank for staying you. with Thank us. You. It's been a great Thank audience. You.